we have our guest speaker today. Um, and by the way, our guest speaker today, uh, Oliver, um, he is also, uh, his nickname is Boy. Uh, so I found that out from his Facebook. But uh, I met him actually in our uh, gathering, in our PMA uh, gathering um, together a few years ago. Uh, as you know, um, some of you know I went to school at uh, PMA and, uh, in Baguio. And uh, he's actually, I didn't have the privilege of uh, being with him at that time because he's 14 years uh, apart in class. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, we, I met him there and I got to sit with this man. And he started sharing uh, about uh, this rescue that he did. And I got so excited about it. He was, was talking about what he did and I found it because I read, everybody read the news about what happened in that uh, uh, hostage uh, of the terrorist um, that, hosted, that took the hostage of these Christian missionaries. And so um, when I heard that that was him that did the rescue, I said, wow. So I started talking. And then more than that, so not, I'm not only excited that he's a brother in, uh, in our uh, alma mater, but also I found as a brother in the Lord, Amen. all the more. So praise God. And when I heard that, I said, wow, you know, you should share your story. Remember that? We should share a story. So I was driving him home um, uh, at that time, and I uh, started sharing about the Lord and how humble this man is. You wouldn't know, uh, you know, because he's so humble when you talk to him. But you know, you get into any kind of situation, he'll rescue you. Wow. All right? So, <laughs> but he, 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 he is actually a, a, a humble man of God. Um, and he, tell me, he told me his life story and his uh, walk of faith, his journey. And so I told him, you know, many people need to to hear about your story. Uh, and what happened though is the years passed and he's moved to the U.S. Um, and uh, of course he's joined with his family uh, today, uh, Ina, and uh, his family and his daughter is here. Uh, and then of course the other relatives that are here. Can you just stand? We just want to recognize your whole family that are here.
for sure that really shaped us into who we are today. I'm a campaign commander. Of course, uh, the basic principle for military men is to know your enemy. But to be honest, uh, doesn't, I don't really care whether it's uh, Samaya or whoever is big there. I address all of them equally. Whether the big leader is there or no, I have to do my job. I have to recover the hostages and to destroy whoever is you know, doing that thing. At the end of May 2001, American missionaries to the Philippines, Martin and Gracia Burnham, made the fateful decision to celebrate their 18th wedding anniversary in a secluded resort on the island of Cabo. About four in the morning, there was pounding on the door, bang, 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 and at first I thought it was a drunk guard or something, and um, Martin kind of knew we were in trouble. And just as he got to the door, it burst open, and in came three guys with M16s, and I think one of them had a mask on. The masked men were Abu Sayyaf, a militant Muslim terrorist group with ties to Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. Along with 20 other guests, the Burnham's were forced from their room at Venom and taken many miles across the open sea to the Muslim stronghold of Basilan. 16 attempts to rescue them. And minus the 17, very moment we started to track them, I have the feeling that they were with that group. And before I even got to the ground, I was shot in the leg. And I kind of slid down the mountain, it was so steep. I slid down a little bit and came to rest beside Martin. And I looked over at him and he was bleeding from his chest. During the gun battle, you know, the grenades were going off all around us and the shooting. But I just kept thinking every moment was my last moment. And um, sometime during that time, I just felt Martin's body just be real heavy. Tragically, Martin was killed during their fight. Gracia was rescued and returned home amidst a national spotlight. I apologize for uh, the result. I mean, I feel bad for Martin. Really, the big light curve, but then that role really triggered the rescue of a big soldier of Christ like her. So, that's how it is. That uh, rescue, like the rescue of Rachel Burnham, can be performed by human hands. But the greatest rescuer of all time is Jesus Christ. I was so happy that I was able to 
share with her and uh, she's a believer. Anyway, uh, I praise and thank God for this opportunity to be uh, with you here today. It's nice to be back in uh, Toronto. We, uh, we've been here for more than uh, five years, almost six years. And we're thankful that uh, we were able to survive those uh, five years. It's been three years since the last time uh, we visited uh, CLC. And uh, it was divine providence that we met uh, Leo and uh, Amy Fabula. And uh, this couple brought us here, and I was like sitting in the corner, but uh, Sir Jerry saw my bald head, so he was like calling me on that side. And, uh, but anyway, uh, the cousin of uh, Amy and uh, Leo Fabula is a common friend of ours, uh, also a friend of Gracia Bernhardt, so she was the one who brought us here. So I'm very grateful and thankful for that. Thank you for inviting me here. Anyway, uh, the Corona Raptors made history. Right? Yeah. Hey, Toronto Raptors! Okay, so though we are now in Illinois, we rejoice with you in those that uh, My heart still belongs to Toronto, but Kawhi bid us goodbye. But you know, uh, life must go on, right? Life must go on, and it simply reminds us that everything on earth is temporary. So, wala forever. Right? So the truth is, wala forever, and only in Jesus is the same yesterday, Amen. today, and forever. Amen. Amen. I hope and pray that there will be still basketball in heaven. I love basketball. So, since we are glorified, there will be no uh, selfish space, you know, press talking or fighting and self glorification. We will all play the game perfectly, for God is perfect, right? So, we are in heaven. We will just enjoy the game and no fighting. Okay? So basketball lovers, keep on dreaming and of course keep on praying. Okay? So I belong to the Philippine Military Academy class of 1995 and uh, our class is very interesting. We have uh, one senator, two congressmen, um, several pastors, businessmen, and of course uh, some of them are still in active service and they are now lieutenant colonels in the armed forces. So uh, in 2000, I have this experience. Uh, we were fighting in um, Magindana, and um, this is a part of uh, the de declaration of an all-out war by President uh, Joseph de Herzegov Estrada. So during that time, I was the platoon leader and um, I was leading the, the first Cal Ranger Battalion. And then we encountered more or less 80 MILF rebels. MILF stands for Moro Islamic Liberation Front. This is a group of secessionist rebels in the southern uh, Philippines, and they want a land of their own. But we know very well that uh, the Muslim faith is not the peaceful kind of faith. I always say that because they have this uh, objective to uh, to conquer the world, and uh, nobody, uh, I mean, uh, not all people knows that. But anyway, so uh, we encountered those uh, eight, more or less 80 uh, and my left rebels. And during that encounter, I got wounded. I almost died in that combat encounter, and I bled for six hours. But the most memorable moment for that is when I got hit. And uh, I'm in the life of that situation, and of course, I remembered my loved ones. But on top of that, I remember that I'm not walking the right kind of walk with the Lord. So I'm not really afraid to die, but I'm ashamed to die. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're ashamed to face your Creator and you have not glorified Him in your life. So during that time, I remembered my family. And of course, I remembered my daughter. And she was just, uh, I think, uh, one, almost two years old at that time. But of course, I remember my wife. So, <laughs> so anyway, I during that life and death uh, situation, my uh, rage man from my right side, he got hit as well in the spine. So he wasn't able to like move from left to right. And I saw the, the, the machine gun fires coming at him. And I told him to move to the right. And he told me, sir, I can't move to the right because I got wounded at the back. And so, and so I was looking at him and upon gazing at him, I saw the last sniper shot of God hit on his head. And so the blood splattered in my face, and I was like so shocked. I was so shocked that I don't know what to do. 
Anyway, I don't know how I was extracted from that battle song, but uh, uh, an hour later, I found myself in a, uh, in a recovery zone because they dragged me from that killing zone. So in that moment, in that moment, I was thinking like, I think I have a purpose. So I was looking for the purpose all along. I know Jesus Christ as my saving uh, Savior from the early age, but I really don't walk like He is my Lord. Mm -hmm. And for those who are believers, you know what I'm saying, but it is always painful to be a waver of God's will. Amen. So in 2001, a year after that life and death uh, incident, I was assigned to Basila. This time, I encountered a different kind of rebels. They're called the Abu Sayyaf. So these people are, uh, as we all know, are kidnapped for ransom terrorists. They always declare that they are uh, fundamentalists, but they are only like making money out of kidnapping people. So anyway, we encountered more or less 100 rebels during that time. We started the fire fight like 6 o'clock in the morning. It concluded at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So it was like a 10-hour gun battle, and we were not able to eat. But uh, as scout raiders, we always uh, cook in advance, so we have like a uh, 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 cooked rice in our backpacks. <laughs> so we like uh, molded it and throw it at each other so that we can at least eat during the fire fight. And uh, after the fire fight, uh, 15 scout raiders were wounded, and again, I was spared. And what a display of amazing grace, right? Yeah. It's really an amazing grace. For this time, the second time I was spared, but I'm not still responding the right way. <laughs> like some of you, I think some of you too, right? You are hard-headed, and you, know, you always follow your heart, and you don't follow what the Lord wants. So a year after that, 2000, so the timeline is like 2000, 2001, and then 2002. This time, this time I was given an opportunity to lead the team who rescued the American hostages. So after the rescue, I'm not going to tell you about the story, okay? Because you will not going to buy the book, right? <laughs> this, is, this I always say, even if you don't have money, I will give you the book. If you don't have money, I will give you the book, okay? So remove that in your mind. Anyway, but I'm not going to, uh, to uh, consume my 30 minutes just for that story because you will read that from the book. Anyway, while standing at the pickup zone, we brought all the wounded soldiers, the dead terrorists, we were able to kill four terrorists, and um, the body of uh, Martin Burnham, because Martin died during the encounter, and um, the body of Nurse Deborah So we put that in the reach. And while waiting for the pickup chopper, I was looking at the grace of Burnham. I never thought, I never thought that someday I will be right here oh, mm -hmm. preaching to you. Amen. Amen. Who would ever thought, what's the possibility of that? So in my thought, she will go back to the United States, go on with her life, and I will go on with my life. But lo and behold, she became an international stock actor speaker. Yeah. And he, she became an author of two best-selling books. And she told me, Oliver, I'm not even a speaker. But she's now a speaker. <laughs> I'm not even a writer. But she has two <laughs> best-selling books. That's why I always say, I'm not an eloquent speaker as well, but I speak, <laughs> right? Yeah. I'm not a writer, but I have a book. <laughs> so they always say there are two things that you have to do before you die, and that is to write a book and to plant a tree, right? I planted a lot of trees since I was in elementary days. <laughs> okay? Now I wrote a book, so I'm now ready to die. <laughs> anyway, so too much for that. We will go to the... Okay, so my message for today is entitled The Greatest Rescue of All Time. So today we will be giving you a crash course, okay? A crash course, a sort of apologetics. Apologetics is just like uh, explaining your faith, right? That would help us in understanding the hope that is within us, especially us Christians. For those who are not believers, you will know later why. And how this hope will impact other people. I will try to present to you the relationship of the Old and the New Testament, basic connection and understanding 
why Jesus Christ was sent by God to redeem mankind. So there are three concepts that we have to understand before we proceed. The first is the fall of man. As we all know, Genesis 3 provides the details how man fell to sin. Genesis, the meaning of Genesis is, of course, the beginning. It is chronicled as the history of humankind. For us Christians, believers, we should embrace the fact that it is history and not just a myth. Otherwise, the core of our belief in Jesus Christ will be in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. We will believe the Bible from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. No exception. Okay? No exception. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. That's what he Amen. says. According to the expositor and Bible teacher John Carter, some people don't like him, <laughs> scientists claim that the following are needed for things to come into being. Time, force, energy, space, and matter. Now, take note of this. In Genesis 1-1, it says, in the beginning, and that is time, God, that is force, created, that is energy, heavens, that's space, and matter, that's earth. Okay? Genesis 3 is known as the chapter that explains the fall of man and the origin of sin. We have to understand that there is an origin of sin. Otherwise, we don't need Jesus Christ. So I am not giving you too much time for the whole chapter, but you can read that by yourself when you go home. So you have an assignment. Okay? Okay. I will give emphasis to Genesis 3. 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Okay? So here, it is being prophesied that a rescuer will come. In this verse, the coming of the Messiah, the Savior, the rescuer was prophesied. Mm -hmm. Understanding this particular verse would later lead us to the understanding of the Toledoth. The Toledoth is just a Hebrew word for genealogy or generations or descendants. In simple words, it provides the continuity of the Messiah's origin from Seth, the son of Adam, to Noah, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, David, and eventually Jesus. Why am I explaining this? Because we Christians, we believe in something, right? We believe in Jesus. But we don't believe blindly. We should believe because we also understand. Amen. The Holy Spirit will guide us to understand it, but we should also study the Word of God. Amen. Amen. The next concept will be Noah and the Ark. The understanding of this concept is very important as well. The story of Noah and the Ark is contained in Genesis 6, 9, and 9 to 17. We don't need to read that right now. Anyway, there is this called uh, uh, the Ark Encounter. I don't know if you heard about it in Kentucky. It was opened in July of 2016. So there's a representative of, of the Ark there. Mm -hmm. The exact uh, uh, dimensions mentioned in the Bible. But, you know, the Ark is now like a, a tourist attraction. People visited the Noah's Ark. But here's what I can say. We always picture Noah's Ark from our BBS time, you know, those who grew up in the church, BBS or whatever. They are so happy going to the Ark, right? But that's very far from the truth. In Noah's time, when people are already drowning, I don't think that's even a very good thing to behold, right? They were inside the Ark, and there are only eight people, by the way, who were saved by God. And that is Noah. His sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. So from those people came the rest of the human kind. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, according to Genesis 6:11. That's why God sent the flood. And the earth is filled with violence. Is there any difference today from the world back then? It might even be worse today. Yeah. Yeah. But God will never destroy earth with blood again. 
Because God said in Genesis 9, 11, Never again shall flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. And God gave us the what? The rainbow. So that's the reason why we have the rainbow in verse 13. It's called the Nuai Covenant. The last concept will be the call of Abraham. Abraham is very important. Abraham is the father of three major religions, which is Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Understanding the origins and the dynamics of these religions will help us understand the geopolitics of the present. Why there are conflicts in the Middle East? Why are the Muslims trying to create conflict all over the world? You will understand it because it was traced back then in the biblical times. Let's read Genesis 12, 1 to 3. I'm using the English Standard Version. Don't question me on that, okay? <laughs> it's just my reference. Now the Lord said to Abraham, later changed to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Verse 2, And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. Verse 3, I will bless you who bless you. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. The land is the physical land God promised to Israel. In fact, it was already prophesied when the Israelites went to Egypt to be slaves, and even when they came out. Some people question, like, why did God, uh, why did the, it took God 430 years before uh, he freed the, the Israelites? Because you know what? Because the sin of the Amorites is not yet right. I mean, God always moves in perfect timing. Even in our lives, sometimes we question. But God's perfect, uh, God's timing is always perfect. Like for us, we went back home in uh, 2004 from the United States. We were visitors. We came home, and my brother told me we will finance our uh, schooling and go back to nursing school, both of us. So we don't have any work, we just go back to school. And we told ourselves, after the schooling, we will take all the exams and of course pass all the exams. You know, you're so arrogant, right? You have the you have the intelligence, you have the resources, and then go back to the United States. That's easy. But you know what? It's not that easy. Yeah. Because you are not God. That's arrogance. Okay? Yeah, of course we pass the NCLEX and everything, but it took us how many years? Seven years. Why? Because seven is the perfect number. Right? And I was born in July 7, 1970. See? But of course, I don't believe in numbers. It's always God who controls our lives. Now, we'll go to the concept of captivity. Captivity. It's defined as the state of being captive. The burden couple was held, held in captivity for 376 days. In a spiritual sense, some of us are still in captivity to sin. While well, some of us were already rescued. Some of us who were rescued are still acting like they are in captivity. And that was me. I always tell people about my shame because the more I tell people about the shame in me, the more God is glorified. When people see me nowadays, they will say, oh man, this is so impossible. Look at him, right? So it's like, ah, look at you before. Man. But it's the glory of God, right? Because from the eyes of the secular world and the public, that's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Anyway, so let's go back to Genesis 3, 1 to 6. It narrates the fall of man as we have previously tackled. You can read the whole chapter by yourself after this service. In Romans 3, 10 says, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No, not one. So no one is accepted. For some people who are not yet believers, they really believe that they are 
are good. Yeah. They seem to think that they are good. But no one is righteous. No, not one. With that declaration, man was pronounced as captive to sin. But God through Jesus Christ offers the hope to rescue him. Which comes to the term called the captor. One that has captured a person or thing. Synonyms, keeper, detainer, and enslaver. When you are captive to sin, you are being captured, kept, or enslaved by it. You do things contrary to God's laws and commands. That's why they can't help it. They continue to sin because they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You are easily influenced by Satan the devil, a great fallen angel as described in Isaiah chapter 14. Satan, who disguised as the serpent in Genesis 3.15, rules the life of a sinner apart from God. A person who did not know Jesus Christ does the things just as the devil wants him to do. But who is this devil? In the military, we have this very important military principle. We call it know your enemy. This principle was attributed to Sun Tzu in his book, The Art of War. We could learn who is who he is by reading God's Word. We can learn who the devil is by reading God's Word. When you are in Christ, you are you are if you are not in Christ, you are condemned and living in sin, though you think you are good. You are captive to sin, thus being ruled by the devil. You can't accept it sometimes to hear that, but you are being ruled by the devil, that's it, you know? Often, one is not aware of it because he or she is spiritually dead. No connection at all, because they thought they have that kind of the right way. But of course, I always give this example. A big truck is coming at you. Your belief is that when the truck hits you, the truck will crumble, and I will still be alive. <laughs> That's my truth, and I will stand by it. But what is the truth? Right? So, there you go. So, according to 1 Peter 5 8, even Christians are also affected by the devil. So that is why, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Amen. So even Christians are not spared by the schemes of the devil. However, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. We belong to God. He can still tempt us and deceive us, but we are not. But if we are not. If you are not abiding in Christ, of course he can do that. But if we are in Christ, no one can touch us from the palm of his hands. The Apostle Paul used the soldier in the Roman times to illustrate how spiritual warfare is done. Because this is a spiritual warfare. A soldier like me understands warfare. But this is a very different kind of warfare. So in Ephesians 6.10 it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against the flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Verse 13, Therefore, take on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as the shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Verse 16, In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And last verse, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the 
we know God. Another important thing that we need to understand about captivity is the concept of sin. God sets the idea, the standard for human behavior. And most frequent biblical words for sin, okay, Hebrew word, hata, it's mean meant originally to miss the mark. Yesterday we have a gathering. Uh, well, Sir Jerry wasn't there, so he missed the action. So, you know what? There are other females here. <laughs> so, you know when females gather, these people think really that they're intelligent. And uh, they know a lot, and you know. Yeah, they're there. That's right. That's right. <laughs> So we were talking about what is right and what is wrong, what is the truth. Now, of course, I'm an undercast, you know, the, the, the playing field is sometimes not uh, level. But I always say that, you know, even if you say your truth, because they always tell me that right and wrong is relative. What is right to you may not be right to me. And I told my upper class man, you know, sir, if, if you were saying there's no right and there's no wrong, what you are saying right now is neither right nor wrong, <laughs> right? So, before we say what is right, for example, I say this is right, you should have a basis for that. When you say that it's right, you have a basis for You are trying to say there's a moral ground for that, right? So, for us Christians, why do we know, how do we know that it is wrong? How do we know? The Word of God says that we have the Ten Commandments. It's like the, it's like the mirror. We are looking at the mirror and it's telling us that it's wrong. Otherwise, if we don't have the concept of right or wrong, everyone can just do what he wishes, right? So now, in the Jewish times, they have 613 commandments. Wow. 613. I wonder why they don't make this 614. Let's just consider the Ten Commandments. Who among you have followed this diligently? Okay, without faith. Or do we know the Ten Commandments at all? <laughs> right? So, you know what? I'm really so holy and I don't have a dirty thoughts. And you know, when you look at a person with a lust in your eyes, you are committing adultery. <laughs> Fail, right? When you don't forgive your brother and you have hate for him, you are committing murder. Wow, that standard is so high. Why did Jesus set that kind of standard? Because no one can really pass it. There's a purpose for that. Because he is the only one who can redeem us and who is the only one who is worthy. Yeah. So the next concept will be captive. So the captor, we're now going to the captain. One who is captivated, dominated, or controlled. That's the person who is under the influence of sin. Captured, in prison, or in bondage. When you are a captive, you need to be rescued. Rescued from what? You know, when you share the gospel, are you saved? Saved from what? From people like you? <laughs> why we have to master the art of sharing the gospel. Yeah, yeah. I always I always do it like a conversation. Okay? So what are your uh, your thoughts about afterlife? I said, oh, I don't have thoughts about afterlife. Oh really? So you really think that we're here on earth and then after that we're gone? Like a bubble, you know? So from that conversation you will present your views. And sometimes what is good is I always ask them first. And then they will say like, so what do you think about first? Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's my opportunity. Okay. Anyway, when you have established that we inherited sin from our father Adam, as we observe, we don't need a child. We don't need to teach a child to be naughty. Right? It's our default system. So no one is teaching us how to sin. We are born sinners. Okay? And we can't help it. That is why we need to be rescued. Okay? We cannot appreciate the good news Unless we understand the implication of the bad news. Now the bad news first. There is hell. I'm sorry, but there is hell. Yeah. When you go home to the Philippines. <laughs> right? 
It's like hell, right? Because it's close to hell. No. Because it's situated in the equator. Okay? Now, I used to be a scout ranger. So I was like, uh, I, I'm always like uh, exposed to the sun. And I don't feel anything. So when we arrive in Canada, I always like run because it's too hot. My wife says, like, what happened to you? You used to be a scout ranger. What's happening? My skin is now uh, sensitive. Oh. <laughs> Anyways, in Matthew 25, 41, it says, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So, originally, hell was prepared for the devil. And everyone has a choice not to be there. A choice that will matter for all eternity. This I always tell people who are not believers. You thought that when you go to hell, that's it. No, it will be for eternity. Eternity. When you have your vacation in the Philippines, it's only a week. And you can stand the hit, right? Now we're talking about eternity. Okay? One of God's manifestation of love is giving us free will. Free will. We have to decide on our own ability to choose. God gave man a free will. It's part of his loving nature. God does not want to drag us to heaven if we don't want to. Ever since, there's always a choice. Let's take a look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 to 17. And the Lord God commanded man, saying, You may eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. That is very clear. Choice and consequences. Another important thing to understand is true faith. True faith will lead a sinner towards freedom from the bondage of sin. Faith is common even though one strongly declares that he or she is an atheist. I always, you know, find it amusing for people to equate their being atheist to, the, to their intelligence. The more they are, they don't believe in God, the more they feel that they're very intelligent. You see? But here's the thing. Everybody has faith. Even if he's an atheist. When you ride a plane, do you know the pilot? You don't know the pilot, right? We don't even know if uh, he took drugs or he's under the influence of liquor. Or when he was a cadet, he was just sleeping during the construction. <laughs> but people believe that the pilot will bring them to their destination. You see, that's great faith. How much more if you experience the power, the mercy, the grace, and the love of God? But in true faith, another thing is very important, and that is repentance. There should be Repentance. It is moving away from sin and going towards God. So when you choose God, you have to move away from sin. Okay. The last one is the rescue. We're not going to the rescue. Rescue is save someone from dangerous or distressing situation. An act of saving someone from danger or distress. In my book, in the last chapter, I discuss in my book the most daring rescues recorded in human history, one of which is the raid at Entebbe, that was the Operation Thunderbolt. I think some of you have seen this movie. It was a counter-terrorist hostage rescue mission carried out by the commando unit Sayeret Makal of the Israeli Defense Forces. The mission lasted for 90 minutes. It was conducted by 100 commandos who were airlifted from Israel and traveled 4,000 kilometers or 2,500 miles from Uganda aboard four Lockheed C-130 Hercules aircraft. Out of 106 hostages, 102 of them were rescued. Five Israeli commanders were wounded and killed in action is only one. And he is, he was Lieutenant Colonel Yunakan Netanyahu, the brother of Benjamin, Prime Minister Benjamin at this time, nothing of that magnitude has ever come close to the daring military operation. The Israeli hostages could not be freed on their own, if not for 
the Israeli commanders. The Burnham couple could not be freed on their own without the Philippine soldiers as instruments. They all need rescuers, right? So the princess and the prince are all the rescuer, one that saves from danger or destruction. At this point of our discussion, we have already established that man needs a rescuer or a savior, right? So the rescue mission I mentioned was done by human hands or efforts. It was indeed great. But the greatest rescue of all time was done by God by sending His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. The perfect sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins. And what is His method? His method is dying on the cross. What? Savior died? Dying on the cross, right? In the Roman times, to be crucified is the lowest form of execution. The Jewish people expected a king. A king on the cross is not a pleasant and appropriate thing to behold. The book of Isaiah was written 1,000 years before Christ. Did you know that? Isaiah, the book of Isaiah. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. 1,000 years before Jesus. Remember? Now, Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And his wounds we are healed. You see, if you read that without knowing that Isaiah was written 1,000 years before, you will immediately say that this is Jesus, right? It's an amazing thing. He did it by grace and mercy. And what is grace? God gave us a gift that we do not deserve. A gift that we do not deserve. For by grace you have been saved in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. So you will not be saved because you are kneeling from here to there, or you will do good works until you will buy your way to heaven. I'm sorry to say, but that's not what the Word of God it says. The Word of God says it is by grace through faith. And what is mercy? Mercy is God withholding the punishment we deserve. When we sin, we are condemned. We deserve death. We deserve hell. But because of God's mercy, He gave us the chance. Yeah. Right? Now, we're going to describe the term victor. One that defeats the enemy or opponent. Synonyms? Conqueror or winner. Nike. Right? Nike is victory. Anyway, so in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55 to 57, it says, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sin? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Only death, only death holds us, but God conquered death. Amen. God through Jesus Christ is victorious in saving us from the captivity of sin. So we are now concluding this. What are the conclusions? Man is separated from God because of sin and needs to be restored or rescued. Man who is captive cannot help himself and needs a savior or a rescuer. Man, through his free will, must accept the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who died on the cross for the atonement of our sins in order to be saved or rescued from eternal damnation. I hope and pray that each one of you will really know the greatest rescuer of all time. You will come to repentance and accept that you are a sinner and you need a rescuer. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for hearing your words today. May you touch each and everyone's heart 
they will realize that they need a savior, they need a rescuer because they are captive in sin. And my prayer for those who are already rescued, may they continue to serve you with all their heart, with all their soul, until Jesus comes. In Jesus' precious mighty name we all pray. Amen. Amen.